Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 5 of my Every Other Thursday Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Out of the Abyss campaign. And let me give you a quick reminder that if you don't want to watch the video, you can also go to my Podbean website, download the MP3 podcast format, and listen to it at work. So, there's a couple of options for you out there. So, the campaign diary is going to pretty much pick up where we left off last time. And the party had just finished up with the Oozing Temple. They had their grand epic finale that they had actually had to fight a gelatinous cube, a black pudding, some yellow mold, and a gray ooze at the same time, or a gray sun. It was actually really good. It was a good fight. There were a couple people that actually went down. And the way that I'm doing these encounters is... I want it to be challenging to them. I don't want them to have a a walk through the park on every single encounter because, let's face it, if they do, then they're going to get bored with it. And I don't want them to get bored with it, so that's why, especially with these guys, they're a little bit more tactical uh, and they love the combat side of D&D. So I'm kind of ramping the, the encounters up. Uh, I'm going to start using more of the, uh, the Tome of Beast. I'm going to start using more of the Book of Layers from Kobold Press. And now that the Yawning Portal's out, I'm going to start using some of the Yawning Portal uh, adventures too. Because let's face it, these guys, even though I will say this, when we first started, they were 150% anti-roleplay, and they actually gave me some shtick over it when I was doing my corny voices and, uh, you know, interacting with the way that I interact with my players with NPCs. But now over the first four and five episodes here, or sessions that we've had, they're actually starting to get into a little bit more role-playing. So... That actually makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm actually doing my job as a dungeon master. But I do want to cater to their needs, and they love just kicking in doors and rolling initiative. And that was pretty much after where we left off last week, where they had just witnessed Slubla Dot being destroyed by the Demogorgon. And they ran, literally ran a couple of miles from, from uh, Slubla Dot. They found a nice little, uh, I guess you could say a nice little nook in, in the uh, the wall of the Underdark. And all of a sudden, a, a female voice started calling out to Eton, which I actually did. I took all of the people that didn't have a, a, a magic item, and I rolled a die for that. And Eton actually came up. So he's going to be the one that gets Dawnbringer here towards the end of Cam's tomb which that's where Dawnbringer is, and that's where she's trying to lure the party into saving her because she's been imprisoned in this tomb for many, 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 many centuries. Uh, so that's where we picked up. And, you know, the party had gone down to the first level. They actually they didn't want to go in at first because they were like, oh, all these female voices. And uh, if you have any kind of voice in your head, that's usually a red flag, Eton. But Eton didn't... He didn't even listen. Eton just went off on his own. So the rest of the party was like, oh, God, we we have to follow him. So they did. And then they ended up in the Tomb of Cam. They uh, kind of checked out the first level, and then it descended down. That's where we ended in a sort of like an, an altar room. And this altar room, <clears throat> it had a couple of uh, doors. There was one on the eastern wall and one on the southern wall. So right off the bat, club and and puck and all these guys are like all right so let's just go ahead and roll initiative now and and like like i said these guys are are seriously combat heavy so i'm going to start giving them more combats which uh, you'll see and, I'm, and like i said i'm going to incorporate uh the tome of beasts i'm going to incorporate the awning portal and maybe some other things as well i, I may even go back to fourth edition uh there is a, a a module out that was called dungeon delve and it had 30 adventures in it 33 part adventures from level 1 to 30 for 4e so i might even start going back to a uh, previous edition and converting some of that content to fifth edition so i can just give them more encounters because let's face it that's what they really want and then i'll plug a little bit of role playing in every once in a while which I think that will really make them happy. And I think they're happy right now. In fact, I really, I know they're happy, uh, but I just want to make sure that continues and, and just give them what they want. So 
Here we go. So where, where we started off, they wanted to roll initiative off of the bat. Uh, this room that they were in, it was an altar room. There was a bunch of gouge marks everywhere on the wall. So everybody's trying to discern what these gouge marks were from, which were basically from the undead spirits that were, you know, trapped here for, like I said, thousands of years and centuries and centuries. So they decided to go to the East and I I'm glad that they, they started to go to the East because Dawnbringer was now telling Eton that he was getting closer. So nobody wanted to open the door, of course, but everybody wants to roll initiative. But Thing actually manned up and says, okay, let's keep the trend going. I'm going to go down in every, every single game, which, which actually he, he has. He's gone down every single game. So he checks the door. He didn't find any traps. He opens the door and then they open up this uh, door where all of their light that they had was kind of shining in. So they could, they could see that there was a beautiful, you know, a, a room that had four sarcophagus in this room. And that's all that they could see. So now thing, he's starting to go into stealth mode and club just pushes him right in. I, <laughs> He was trying to be all stealthy and stuff, and Club just came up behind him and says, all right, there you go, boy, there you go, mate, boom, and, and just threw him right in. Well, as as Finn goes in, he, he sees the four sarcophagus, and then he notices that on the lids of these sarcophagus, there is like a gold uh, etched, uh, like a figure on top, and it represents who is in each one of these sarcophagus. So now... I turned the neon lights on saying we're open for business. <laughs> you know how it works guys. So I turned the neon lights on. It says, open me. They see this, you know, these gold embroidered, uh, embroidered cart sarcophagus. They think that there's a lot of treasure inside. Now they got their juices flowing. Fergie's now starting to stand at the door and Fergie actually does something really smart. And I gave Fergie an inspiration for doing this. Fergie used, because Fergie is a cleric, you know, Fergie used sense, you know, to sense danger. And I told him that there were spirits located in each of these sarcophagus because it, it's for a pretty, pretty decent radius. I think it's uh, up to a mile or something like that. And then I also told Fergie that he also sensed another spirit to the east and it was through the wall which there was actually a uh, like a hidden secret compartment that actually led to a, a tomb, the real tomb of Kaim. And to the south, when they came into the second level of the, the, the tomb, there was a door on the south. Now that door actually leads to a false tomb. But with Fergie being smart, got inspiration rewarded, she actually sensed that there was another spirit on the other side of the wall. So they had that, that hook that could take them, you know, if they completed the entire complex, obviously Dawnbringer would still be communicating with Eton, but now they know that there's something beyond the Eastern wall, which is, which is good. So they started going around all these and, and the names on the sarcophagus were basically the head advisors and servants for this Lord Cam. And this is where they were laid to rest after they died. So when Finn goes in there, uh, well, actually not on his, not by voluntarily by what he wanted to do. He wanted to stealth and club kind of, you know, pushed him in. He kind of slid on the floor. Well, as he was looking at, at all the different sarcophagus and checking them out, looking for traps and trip wires and everything else, he kicked something. He, he, you know, he kicked something and then he looked down and it was, it was an arm that was sticking out from behind one of the sarcophagus. And then he, he looks and, and it was something that was familiar to him. It was remember the, the, uh, the halfling Fargus Rumblefoot. Last session when he took the dagger from the fountain and then drunk the potion of invisibility and poof, vanished. Well, guess what? Fargus Rumblefoot was now dead behind one of these uh, sarcophagus. So 
<laughs> Thing said, wow, I just hit the lottery. And, he, and he's looking around and searching Thing and finds the dagger that Vargas had took last session. And he said, oh, this is the dagger that I deserve. So he's, he's now trying to peel this dagger out of the hand of uh, Fargus Rumblefoot. And by this time, when he's trying to pull this out, all of a sudden we start to hear in chat, hello, hi, hi. And Puck's daughter came into his uh, game room and was sitting on his lap, and she had this crazy little, like, Karopi hat from uh, one of those little uh, kid shows or something like that, the little frog hat. So she was asking everybody if everybody had hats. So I reached over and put on my dragon hat. Everybody had hats on. It was it was really cool. But the thing is, Club didn't have a hat. <laughs> <laughs> and club said that he needed to climb into the attic because he had a box of hats up in the attic. So he went AFK. And then when he came back, he had his hand wrapped up. Like he had just been through a war or something. <laughs> and, and club had actually sliced his finger open getting into the attic, but he had this like Ebenezer Scrooge type of, uh, stocking cap on that. He was going to fall asleep or something. So we started having a, a contest to see who got, who had the best hat. So Puck's daughter, she was looking at, at everybody's hats and she loved it. You know, uh, I had my dragon hat on Puck, put on a hello kitty hat. Uh, Eton had an awesome Cobra commander helmet. I mean, this thing probably should have won. Uh, Fergie had on like a pup, like a puppy hat from his kid. Oh man, there were so many great hats and, uh, it, it was fun. Uh, you know, club had the Ebenezer Scrooge hat, Fingerella put on this like old hillbilly hat. This, uh, it was great. It looked like the hillbilly hat from the old Mountain Dew can and the old Mountain Dew, uh, logo that said it will tickle your innards. And then Jimson had on a, a German Kaiser hat. So everybody had these hats on. So now everybody's getting their wives and their girlfriends and showing everybody the hats. And Puck's daughter, she said, oh, I like his dragon hat. He won. Obviously, the Cobra Commander hat, in my opinion. I mean, this this was a real Cobra Commander helmet. This was badass. And, uh, but I won. So I gave myself a, an inspiration for winning. And then I gave everybody an inspiration for actually, you know, putting hats on and all that good stuff. So it, it was awesome. <clears throat> it was fun to kind of break away from the game for a second, for, you know, for one of the kids and goof around, uh, with the kid. So Jimson, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. Jimson is Mr. Business. He he is the one that and also also Eton. He does this as well, but not as much as Jimson. When everybody starts to get off on tangents and there are a lot of tangents within this game where everything from talking about nacho parties to, you know, uh, let's take a trip this weekend to here or let's do this. So, there's a lot of digression in this game. But Jimson, Mr. Business, man, he's the one that, uh, old Thundersnow, he's the one that gets everybody back in check and gets everybody back uh, on, on track on, on getting the, the game going again. And I just sit back and I just, I just listen to this. I mean, because the stuff that these guys come up with is just awesome. I mean, everything from the camp and trip where as the boats were going by, they were, you know, squatting down in the water, taking poops in front of the boat. <laughs> I mean, for I mean, just the most crazy shit that you'll ever hear, guys, it goes on here. So Mr. Business, he gets us back on track, right? And he is the voice of reason for the party, that's for sure. I, and I'm going out on a limb saying that. And Eton, he's, he's a close second. So now at this point, they're, they're tired of waiting for Fang to open these, you know, these sarcophagus up. And so club just goes over and says, okay, I'm going to open one of these up. So he put, takes the lid and he pushes it. And as he, as he does it, Fingerella uh, is able to detect a trap just as this happens. And that's the way, I, and I love the way that it worked out like this. And Fergie, remember Fergie also did sense danger. So he knew that there were spirits in every one of these sarcophagus. And he told everybody to be careful and club. No, no regard at all. Just goes in 
throws open one of the lids, a, a hissing sound is being made now, and then all of a sudden this black smoke rolls out of the sarcophagus, and this silhouette appears and forms on top of the sarcophagus. And then Fergie yells, you effing idiots. <laughs> I told you there was evil within all of these. So by this point, all of the lids of the sarcophagus start to slide open. More of this black mist starts to pour into this sarcophagus room. And we have four specters that are attacking the party. The party did really good here. And the specters had a pretty nice challenge rating compared to the party. But the party, you know, there's six of them and there's four specters. So I beefed up the to hit and the damage a little bit more on them. Plus they did a life drain and, but there were no successful life drains because of the, the party actually did some pretty clutch constitution saving throws, which was actually good on their part because the specters actually could have taken their max hit points down to a, a, a you know, lower than what it normally would be. And then, you know, it'd be, would be detrimental. They'd have to try to get their, uh, all of their hit points back during long rests. And so, so it was good that they actually made all of their saving throws. So now the, the party's starting to funnel into the room. Uh, the first thing Fergie, he actually had the high initiative here and Fergie took one of his abjuration, uh, spells called, uh, I think it's abjure enemy. And he cast it on one of those, which is sort of like a like a fear, or maybe like a single target turn undead. So one of those was eliminated for the combat for the entirety of of the combat as long as it lasts, and that was good. That was the last one they actually kind of gang banged on. Thing he was doing a lot of jumping from sarcophagus to sarcophagus, so I was allowing him to do acrobatics checks, and players like that. When they say, hey, I want to do a tumbling roll off of the, you know, tumble, jump off of the wall. I've actually seen DMs say, no, you can't do that. I'm, I don't, I hate to say no to players. I very rarely ever say no. And in fact, I said no last week to one of my players that wanted to, I think, come up from being uh, unconscious with an inspiration. But I, I didn't allow that. But normally, I never say no. So I let him tumble around the room, and he was actually doing good. I mean, he actually had a couple of crits on his acrobatics check. So he was going into, and this is where the role playing starting to come in now with these guys, and he's starting to describe these cinematics as he's jumping from sarcophagus to sarcophagus, and in the air as he's flipping, he's attacking the specters, and. I like that kind of stuff. That that stuff woos the shit out of me as a DM. I love that. So he was doing that. And then we had, uh, as Fing landed on one of the other sarcophagus, I was thinking, hmm, how could I incorporate Fargus Rumblefoot back into the, uh, the equation here? So I went ahead and I just grabbed uh, just a basic zombie out of my monster uh, uh, module there in, in Fantasy Grounds. And I dropped the token on there. And then I said, all of a sudden, Fargus Rumblefoot stands up with his milky eyes, and he said, I want my dagger back, Fingerella. <laughs> and that was great. So everybody started laughing on that. And that was just something that just came off the, the top of my head. But I gave him the stats for like a hulking zombie. So he was he was a little bit stronger than, than a normal zombie. And Fingerella, his response to that, he said, kiss my ass, Fargus, and he kicked him. And when he kicked him, because it was his turn then, after Fargus stood up, turned towards him, and attacked and missed, he was on top of the sarcophagus, right? So Fingerella kicks and kicks his head off. So <laughs> he says, I want to kick his head off. I said, okay, no problem. I said, his head goes flying off and hits the other side of the wall. So he was happy about that. And during the whole fight, and it eventually ended, and nobody went down, so Fing actually survived. Fing was sort of like the star for this. Uh, Puck had used an ensnaring, ensnaring strike on the zombie, which it, which was kind of funny because it actually pinned Fingerella against the wall. So Fing would have moved without using cunning action, which he loves to do all the time because he forgets to use cunning action. I think it's because of, by the time 
halfway into the night, he's he's already had a couple of drinks or so because he's gone down a couple of times. So he goes off and gets drinks. So I think that's probably why re, the reason why he forgets about cunning action. And I I don't remind him about it because I love the comedic the comedical factor about it. So of course I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> But Fang was actually, he was the star of the of that fight. And during the entire fight, Dawnbringer kept, I kept sending tells to Eton saying, oh, you're getting closer. You're getting closer. And so, you know, this was luring him, trying to get him to, you know, stay focused with trying to find this Dawnbringer. And then we had, we went ahead, we, everybody went ahead and cleaned up. They, um, uh, looted everything uh there were some beautiful decorative bracers that of course fergie took those and fergie the whole entire time is trying to show everybody his his bracer and he goes oh these things are beautiful these bracelets and it goes with my necklace and it goes with my my drow mask and my my pink and light yellow scarves and <laughs> they, were, they were complaining about the loot <laughs> it was great they were saying oh this is a bunch of shit loot so now that the party has all of their awesome loot, and Fergie is the one that actually benefited from it, Fergie has got thousands of gold worth of jewelry that she's wearing. You know, face masks, scarves, all these rings and rings on her toes or his toes. Well, I, I still don't know yet. But they have this voice that just keeps calling to Eton. Nobody can hear it except for Eton, of course. And he's trying to tell the party that, hey, this female, this, you know, this woman named Dawn keeps telling me that we're getting closer and closer and closer. So that's when the light bulb appears above Fergie. Because remember, when Fergie went into the, the chamber and sensed danger, Fergie, uh, I, you know, I don't know if I should say he or she. So anyway, Fergie, remember, detected the spirit that was beyond the east wall. So now they're all trying to find out what's going on. And, and Fingarella says, hey, I remember one other time when I was adventuring, I found a sarcophagus that actually moved, which was great. I mean, that was great that he thought of that and role played it out. So he started searching the sarcophagus and had a really good investigation check. So I told him that the sarcophagus in the lower right-hand corner of the room actually was on like a bed of rollers. So he goes down there and checking, and Club just comes up and just pick. I mean, he rolled a crit on his strength check, and he just, I, I said, you just pick this sarcophagus up, and you throw it, and he threw it against the wall, and it just shattered. And below, there was a five-foot hole that they could climb down into that was going to go somewhere else. And Dawnbringer, she's getting excited. It's orgasmic for her now because she's saying, yes, yes, you're so close. And <laughs> so I'm, I'm sending messages to Eton the whole time. And, and, and Eton's just trying to, he's trying to communicate telepathy with this Dawnbringer. And at first I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going with it. But now I'm like, you know what, let's have some fun with Eton. So... Don is now starting to have these private conversations with Eton with Entails, which I think that's that's actually pretty cool. So Fing goes to climb in, and then uh, Club said, "Ho ho ho, wait!" So of course they tied on the rope like they do anytime. These guys are rope monkeys, big time, which I think it's actually pretty smart to be honest. So Fing climbs down into the hole, and then I see in the chat box. A message from Eton that says, Hey Don, we just sent down a sacrifice for you. <laughs> being, <laughs> being Fingerella going down into the hole. So now Fingerella is climbing through this small little shaft, goes down about 10, 15 foot, and then it starts to go to the east. And he's being really cautious. He's not the only one, actually, because now everybody's starting to follow behind him. And as he starts to go east, now within his dark vision, he can see that there's like a wall at the end. And he doesn't see that it's turning right or left or anything like that. But when he gets closer to the wall, he realizes that there's a couple of small little peepholes. And then with further inspection, he figures out that it's plaster. 
So now they're starting to say, okay, they, they look through the holes, well, actually, Fing does, and they see this large, beautiful tomb that has been undisturbed by time. There's no dust. There's beautiful murals on the wall with all kinds of uh, scripture, glyphs, uh, dioramas, everything. And it, like I said, there's a on the eastern wall, there is a, a huge coffin and it's sitting on an altar, probably about or a pedestal, probably about two or three off, two or three feet off of the wall, and it has a solid gold lid. So I turn the the neon lights back on for him. Loot me, you know what I mean? So now he's like, oh wow, look at this, you know, the, all the beautiful murals on the wall, the gems that are embedded into the wall. I I, I totally bait these guys, and I know that they're gonna fall for it, even if I really didn't even bait them. These guys are just, these guys are adventurers. They're dungeon delvers at heart. So I know that they're going to go in there. So now things like, okay, we got to figure out how to get through this, this wall. And it was made of like a, uh, like a thick plaster. So he, he says, oh, I don't have enough strength to get through here. So him and Eton starting to shimmy his way up through everybody, and it's such a cramped space. So everybody's saying, "Hey, is that a is, is that a weapon in your pocket, or are you just happen to see me?" And whoa, what was that? And stuff like that. So Eton is just fixing to bust through this wall, and as he takes his weapon and then he starts to hit it, Club grabs it and says, "Oh wait, maybe we should let Fing check for this." Because remember, they're always saying, Fing, don't even waste your time because you're going to start, you know, you're going to fail all of, all of your checks. But lately, now that Fingerella had got those magical thieves tools from Fargus, he's actually been pretty successful on all of his checks. So now, uh, Club stops Eton from breaking through the plaster and says, okay, let's let Fing do his job. And he did. Fing starts looking around, and he found this massive complex trap. And, and, I, and I wanted this to be a very complex trap because I wanted them to work together as a group. I wanted both the casters and Fing to work together. And there was, a, uh, there, there was like, a, like a copper wire with a couple of runes and, and needles. And if the, the plaster was going to be disturbed then there was going to be a fire and lightning trap go off simultaneously and basically engulf the entire uh, chamber that they were in. You know, this secret chamber. So now, Fingerella is explaining this to everybody. So Jimson's starting to come up because there's some arcanic knowledge that's going to be involved with this. And everybody else's tokens are starting to move back out and back into, back into the upper chamber. So Fing and, and they actually discuss this for a couple of minutes. And they know that if the, the plaster is moved, the, the wires will, you know, trip the needles. The needles will basically uh, scratch against the runes, setting them off, engulfing everybody in fire and lightning. So with all this beautiful preparation, all of this strategy, I go ahead and tell Fing Dorella to put a Thieves' Tools check into the dice tower. And he rolls a two. I mean, he literally rolls a two. It was awesome. It's it's like a DM's dream. So I, I told him that uh, a drop of water basically came off of his off of his forehead and 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 just distracted him and make him made him jitter for just a second as it kind of tickled him. And he set off both traps simultaneously. <laughs> so him and Jimson got lit up, uh, and they took the lightning damage. And I didn't take the lightning damage out of the tunnel because everybody by this end was by this point was almost out of the, the tunnel. But the fireball that exploded and that the concussion from that blast came up and got pretty much everybody in the other room as well. And then after, you know, they're both unconscious now. So Jimson and uh, Fingerella, they're both unconscious now. So now the party's got to go back down and they use just about all of their healing potions. Because remember, in the early sessions, I was giving them quite a few healing potions. And then I had mentioned several campaign diaries back that I was going to start cutting them off of all of these healing potions. Well, I have. So now they're using all of these healing potions to get Fing and Jimson back up. So now they, I think they have like a total of two healing potions left. But 
this this you know the secret tomb is now open that plaster wall of course was blown out so they very carefully and very gingerly start to go into this large tomb that has this beautiful gold lid on the sarcophagus and they got they got it they had enough to get jimson up but fingerella was still unconscious because they, I think they used a healing potion, and then they had the rope around Fingerella, and they, <laughs> they drug Fingerella into the room, and the the chamber was ten foot high, so they had to actually kind of jump down into the room. So Fingerella's unconscious, right? And they pull with the rope, they pull, and he comes out of the chamber and just slams down on the ground ten feet. So that's a D six. So I give him an automatic death saving throw. <laughs> the for the round and he said oh thanks guys <laughs> that, was, that was great but now they're all in this room and but but of course there's all kinds of plaster and a lot of the paint had chipped off of the the beautiful murals that are on the wall and all that good stuff and they they're they're eyeing this this sarcophagus that's on the east wall that has the neon lights flashing above it saying you know take me take me take me so jimson He's getting in and now he's starting to search around around the room because things out. Of course, you know, the game's official now. Fingerella's down and this, this is the fifth straight game that he's gone down in, con, uh, in combat. So Jimson now, he's, he's the sorcerer, but yet now he's doing the job of the rogue that's unconscious. And he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> so Jimson's going, he says, if Fing can do it, I can do it. So good old Jimson, he's searching around... You know, this tomb, pieces of plaster everywhere, pieces of rubble from the fireball explosion. So he's trying to do the job of Fing. And as he gets close to this beautiful sarcophagus with the gold lid, all of a sudden, another black mist starts to pour out of the, the sarcophagus as the lid by itself kind of shifts back a little bit. And out comes a wraith. And this wraith, which is actually Lord Brysis, welcomes all of the party members. He says, Welcome. Your death will be swift, and you will join me in the afterlife and serve me. And everybody's like, F fuck you. No, we're not. <laughs> so initiative is rolled. And as Lord Brysis, he has the, the high initiative, which actually worked out really good. Lord Bryce summons a massive behemoth zombie. And it literally, I had it bust out of the floor like the Kool-Aid man. Uh, so they got a kick out of that. A and, and this thing is 10 foot by 10 foot. So this hulking zombie is like as big as uh, the room. You know, the ceiling's about 10 foot high. And he just takes up so much room. So there's going to be a lot less maneuvering around without using your action and disengage or something like that. And then on the next turn, I had Lord Bryce's summon a specter as well. But this zombie, I mean, it, as the party was, you know, filling in, the zombie was coming up, the fight was on. And this was going to be a really challenging fight. But hey, the end result was getting Dawnbringer. So these guys haven't had a rest in a while. I think the last session they took at the beginning had a long rest. So they've actually been in the, this tomb for almost two sessions now. Well, a session and a half, and they haven't taken a rest. They haven't even taken a short rest to use hit dice seals. So these guys are, are wounded, especially from the fireball. They're about out of potions. So things could get pretty hairy, and it did. Because they were kind of ignoring Lord Bryce's. They were trying to focus on the zombie. And the zombie was doing great. I mean, the zombie took down Club. The zombie took down Eton. Puck was almost dead. Puck disengaged and even jumped on the, the body of Club to get back into the, uh, the shaft because he wanted to run away. He had like two hit points left. But I went ahead and I took the Spectre. And I, and I turned it into an its ethereal form, and it just kind of whisked through everybody and followed Puck into the, the, the shaft that they came out of. And on the Spectre's turn, it actually hit Puck, so now Puck was down. Fingerella just came up 
from Jimson. I think Jimson uses last potion on him. And so Fingerella had maybe six or seven life. Jimson was now getting uh, bombarded. Jimson did not have any spell slots left. So now Jimson's starting to use his sort points to get more spell slots left. And he had enough to get one spell slot. And by this point, now the, the zombie was down. Fing took down the zombie. The specter was still up into the sh in, in the shaft, you know, munching on the brains of uh, Puck. And then the specter came back down. And by this point, the wraith, Lord Bryce's, had about five hit points left. And it was either going to be Jimson or the wraith. And, and Lord Bryce's actually missed Jimson. So Jimson took his last spell slot after, you know, using his bonus action to convert the spell points and cast a Scorching Ray. And the Scorching Ray, he hit with, it was clutch. And he used all three of his, uh, and he actually used Inspiration. He had one Inspiration left. And he took Bryce's down. But the Spectre was up. But seeing that, you know, I, I went ahead and said that, seeing that Lord Bryce's summoned the Spectre, that as Lord Bryce's dissipated, uh, the Spectre disappeared. And now, I mean, the, the party guys, there's like four m members of the party down unconscious. They have no inspiration. They're out of potions. These guys are in bad shape now. So now is when they decided, let's go ahead and, and take a, let's take a long rest. So they did. And I went ahead and I, you know, rewarded them and said during the, you know, the long rest, they, they, they found Dawnbringer. As Eton came back up, you know, she introduced herself as Dawnbringer and, and told her story of, you know, the, the, the last wielder of her was a hero and such and such and such. And uh, at this point, Puck is like, Dawnbringer's a bow, right? Isn't Dawnbringer a bow? Because everybody now had a magic item except for Puck. But I, I actually gave Puck a bow, too. It was in, it was in the, uh, the sarcophagus. And Club... He finds the hidden compartment on the sarcophagus as he's kind of searching around, finds a bunch of money. The party, you know, I, I reward the party for this because they they did a great job. Uh, and I, I think they're going to start, I think a couple are going to multi-class in the cleric now. I think they, they realize this is going to be a problem later on. So I think that they're going to start doing some cleric and with their other, you know, ranger and stuff like that. So I gave him 2,000 gold, 1,000 in gems. Uh, Jimson got a necklace of fireball. I actually rolled nine beads. It was a 1d6 plus three for the amount of beads, and I rolled a six. So now Jimson's got this necklace of fireball with nine beads, and that's going to be great because he doesn't have spell sculpt. He's not a, an evocation mage, so he's going to be blasting people with these beads, which is, is going to be great. I actually gave him one greater healing potion, and Club took that. Uh, there was a filter of love. And Puck took that, which was actually pretty cool because he wants to coat his arrows with this potion, this filter of love. So I'm going to allow him to do that. Then I also gave uh, a bow of endless arrows, which actually didn't have a string. It kind of reminded me of the bow from, remember the old Dungeons and Dragons uh, cartoon back in the 80s? So I kind of mimicked that bow off of that. So Puck was happy. He got his bows, plus one to hit, plus two to damage, and unlimited arrows. So uh, I also, uh, there was some more jewelry that Fergie took. And also remember, Fingerella took that dagger from uh, Fargus Rumblefoot. So that was a plus one uh, to hit, plus one to damage dagger. So now everybody's got at least one magic item. Fing's got two. He's got the thieves' tools also. So now that was what I wanted to do. By the time they got to level four, uh, I wanted everybody to have at least one magical item. So now I'm going to start putting some armor and some other things in there. And they're going to have a, now that they've got a bunch of this money, they're going to have an opportunity to spend it in the next session because I'm going to introduce to them an NPC that one of my viewers created years back called Mick the Peddler. And you, go, you guys know that Mick the Peddler, he drives around in a, a coilless of apparatus, or, uh, and he just, he's a merchant of the Underdark. So they're going to they're gonna find his, uh, 
seaside shanty there in the dark lake and I want to start incorporating more things into Out of the Abyss too. I, I like Out of the Abyss, but I think there's a lot of there's a lot of void in Out of the Abyss too. There's a lot of travel times between X point and Y point. Like I said in the early campaign diaries, so I want to incorporate more uh, adventures. I, I want more dungeon delving for these guys. You know, like I said. I'm going to start converting some of this 4th edition Dungeon Delve stuff. I'm going to incorporate that into Out of the Abyss. I'm also going to take probably something from the Yawning Portal. Probably the Shrine, because they're about in that level range right now. And uh, I'll probably go ahead and take the, the from Kobold Press, the uh, Book of Layers. I'm probably going to start doing some of that stuff too. So they're just going to be Dungeon Delving all over the place, because I know that's what they want to do. You know, and it, and I and I like how they're picking up more of the role playing aspect of the game, uh, but that's just not the type of players they are. Which it, which is which is good though. They are, like I said, they are doing some role playing now, especially compared to the first couple of sessions where they were, you know, kind of giving me shtick for making the the NPC uh, voices and stuff. But but now they're starting to do it, so it's like. It's like it's starting to rub off on them, which is good. And like I said earlier in this episode, it makes me feel good, and it makes me feel like uh, I'm actually, you know, doing my job. So remember, Eton gets Dawnbringer, okay? And we're talking about Dawnbringer, you know, talking about all of the stats and how it can shed light in 30 feet, and it'll grow up to like 60 feet, and you know, it's plus two, it's an intelligent weapon, and all this stuff. And and then Puck says we should rename that weapon to Dongbringer, <laughs> and everybody was in total agreement of that. And Eton just kind of sighed a little bit, and he said, "Guys, this is my first intelligent weapon that I've ever had playing D and D in all these years. Don't ruin it for me." But everybody's now uh, calling Dongbringer Dongbringer, and then Club he's got that shake weight. And he's like, just like pumping it. And he's saying, dong bringer, dong bringer. Oh <laughs> it was so freaking hilarious, man. It, it was awesome. So the party gets their long rest. They get fully healed. They get all their spell slots back. I, I you know, I, I don't even make them do an encounter roll because they, you know, they had done good. They had done well for two encounters and they were basically just, they were depleted. Now they got at least a healing potion, uh, one healing potion. Club had the greater healing potion, and uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be giving them too many more. But they're gonna have the opportunity to buy them. So, but I mean, how many times are they gonna be able to buy this stuff whenever they're kind of traveling throughout the Underdark? It's not like there's a Lion Shield uh, a Lion Shield coster on every single corner down here in the Underdark. But like I said, I'm gonna do some economy control next next session. And I'm going to let them find Mick the Peddler. Uh, and I'm also going to give them some transportation as well. Mick's going to have a boat there. A super steam, uh, like a super souped up uh, like piece of crap looking barge. And then they're going to meet another famous character that I'm going to put in. And I'll tell you about him next time. But everybody, if you're a fan of the Forgotten Realms, uh, if you've read a certain trilogy about the Underdark way back in the 1980s, you'll know who this famous elf is. Maybe it's a, a drow elf, a particular drow elf. But they're going to meet uh, someone else as well next time. So they still have, remember, they still have that chamber to the south. That was in the, the second uh, level when they came down into the second level of the tomb. So they were mentioning that they wanted to take care of that, which is basically a false tomb. And I'm going to do something special with that. We'll talk about next time. And then they're going to be out of the, the tomb of, of Cam. And then they're going to meet Mick the Peddler next episode and a certain other famous drow elf from the Forgotten Realms and Menza Barons on. So that's it for this time, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the campaign diary. We're already five sessions in. So thank you guys very much. You'll be able to listen to this on my podcast website, and the link will be down below. Join the discussion, guys. If you guys have any ideas for me, if there's any uh, any kind of 
content that you would like to see me put into the game, maybe some type of encounter, maybe you have a special NPC that you would like to see, that's what the comment section's for, guys. Let's discuss this stuff. I always check the comments. So leave a comment below. Thank you guys again. I appreciate it. And I'll see you next week for session six of the campaign diary. And until next time, happy gaming and keep it savage.